Welcome back to another episode of the For the Property Investor podcast. And we're here with the weekly news. And of course, the only man that brings us the news is Nick Bendel. Well, thank you for having me, Owen. I, I don't know why, but it feels like it's been just five minutes since we last did one of these episodes. It always feels like that for me. So, you know, I don't, I don't know why you uh, all of a sudden it's uh, just happened for you. It's like, yeah. Well, I, I do apologise for that. That's something I'll have to work on. Yes, yes. Uh, that that would be much appreciated, Nick. And this is usually the part in the show where you ask me what I've been up to over the past week. Oh, if I have to. It's like, geez, it's, um, uh, it's all about you, isn't it, Nick? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I do like it when it's all about me. <laughs> All right. What did you get up to in the past week, Nick? Oh, I, I thought you'd never ask. Well, <laughs> I own a business called Hunter and Scribe, which write, it's a copywriting agency that writes content for finance and property professionals. We work with dozens of mortgage brokers throughout Australia. And last week, I flew from my hometown of Sydney to Melbourne for the SFG conference. It was a really, really good conference and fantastic speakers and got to catch up with a lot of brokers who I already know and also make some new broker friends. Fantastic. Glad to hear. I love mortgage brokers, obviously, because I was one in a past life, but um, yeah, it's going well. Um, busy week for us as well in property management across, um, across the country. Um, being mid-November, where uh, lots of people are trying to uh, move before Christmas and get set in, settled in, and um, those all important um, uh, s school cap catchment zones where people will need to get in the right area to be able to get their children in the right place. So that's all happening in the month of November. Hmm. Got a question for you. Uh, so you talked yeah. about people looking to get stuff done before Christmas. I'm wondering what is generally the busiest month for a property management business, and what's generally the quietest month? Um, for leasing is, um, oh, that's, um, it really can be up and down. Um, it, it's hard to tell. Generally, it is quiet over the uh, December, January months, and um, and it can generally be busier in the, in the uh, spring, early summer months. So it's uh, that that's probably the 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 best way I can answer that. Um, okay, well, shall we move on to our three news stories for today? Yes, what's in the news, Nick? Our first story today is RBA remains concerned about inflation. In disappointing news for anyone hoping for imminent interest rate cuts, the RBA has forecast that inflation will rise in the second half of next year. Inflation recently fell to 2.8%, putting it within the RBA's target range of 2 to 3%. The RBA has forecast that inflation will continue falling, reaching 2.5% by the end of the year, but will then rise to 3.7% by the end of next year. The RBA says inflation has been falling primarily due to the federal government's cost of living support measures, which were introduced on the 1st of July, 2024. The reason inflation is expected to start rising again in the second half of next year is because these support measures will end on the 30th of June, 2025. The RBA says that interest rates will need to be, quote, sufficiently restrictive until the RBA is confident that inflation is, quote, moving sustainably towards its target range. But the RBA's latest forecasts, quote, do not see inflation returning sustainably to the midpoint of the target until 2026. Okay, Owen, if the RBA's mm. forecasts on inflation turn out to be correct, and if the RBA really means what it says about keeping monetary policy restrictive until it has defeated inflation, does that mean the RBA won't start cutting rates until 2026? Quite possibly. And... Um, uh... Does that mean that as as we predicted, all this government expenditure to pay people's um, 
bills for their energy bills to be able to help bring down inflation um, and provide cost of living uh, relief? Has that just been a, a big waste of money to try to, um, uh, in, in the effort to bring down interest rates earlier? <clears throat> and of course, to um, um, maybe buy some election votes. Because funnily enough, I think we're meant to have a federal election by 30th of June 2025, aren't we? I think maybe May, uh, which is interesting because there's a good chance that inflation will be a key election issue. And given that these cost of living support measures are scheduled to end not long after the election, I wouldn't be surprised if both parties pledge to keep them for at least one more year. Yes, well, um, when we've got the RBA um, specifically saying moving sustainably, um, that means without any government intervention. Um, that's that's the code word. Um, so we um, really need to see that happening, and um, and the RBA is right. It, it, we we it, if there's a false economy happening uh, due to government intervention. Uh, then um, they they can't rely on on the on those figures. So so the question I asked you a couple of minutes ago, there were two big ifs built into that. First one is okay. was if the RBA's forecasts turn out to be right in terms of inflation rising next year, and forecasts are wrong all the time, so we don't know if those forecasts are going to turn out to be right. The other one was if the forecasts do turn out to be right. Uh, if the RBA really means what it says about keeping interest rates higher for longer. Let's assume the forecasts do turn out to be right. Do you think the RBA would be willing to keep interest rates higher for longer? The RBA will be um, willing to keep, um, keep doing whatever they need to, to be able to get hold of um, inflation and get get it under control. And if that means not reducing rates till 2026, then yeah, that's what it will take. Um, they will do whatever it takes. And so, and that, that's why anyone that understands a macroeconomic environment and all of these band-aid measures that federal and state governments have done to provide cost of living uh, relief in the form of um, bringing down energy prices uh, in the hope that that would help inflation figures. We knew it was just a short-term um, band-aid solution that wasn't going to fix the long-term problem. We know for a fact, and we've discussed this many times before in previous episodes, we know for a fact that Michelle Bullock and Jim Chalmers listen to this podcast. They're avid listeners. There's only so much Michelle Bullock and the RBA can do to defeat inflation. All they can do is move the cash rate up and down. The federal government has much more power to influence inflation through fiscal policy. So given mm. that inflation appears to be lingering for longer than we expected, is it time for the government to start cutting spending and raising taxes? It couldn't hurt. But um, yeah, giving handouts out is um, much better for uh, winning votes. Hmm. So uh, you do sound a little cynical. I, I raised two possibilities, cutting spending and raising taxes. Would you do just one of those two or do you think both are in order? Um, I. I think, I mean, cutting, I mean, ra raising taxes just for the sake of raising taxes, it's, um, uh, I mean, what's, I mean, firstly, politically, it would be, um, um, yeah, political suicide. Um, so it would, it would need to be done for a targeted reason that is, um, uh, that would be a, a long term um, uh, good reason to raise rates. Or bring in a new tax, whatever that might be. So um, cutting spending, it's uh, is always the easiest uh, thing to do, and but that that quite often uh, involves laying off staff, 
and um, the government's concerned about uh, doing that uh, in this economic environment because uh, that could um, make the situation worse. So it's um, so again politically, um, it could be uh, suicide for them to do that. But um, certainly, and, and most the only other area is. Um, is infra infrastructure spending, which uh, there has been a lot of, um, but most of those decisions were made a long time ago. So um, yes, maybe the the delaying of um, any next stages or uh, whatever it might be to be able to um, help soften that um, spending in the economy uh, could help. So um, yes, that 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 would be the. Uh, the area that I would look at for um, uh, trying to decrease spending. It's interesting in that there are no pain-free options. We can have higher inflation or we can have higher interest rates or, or we can have higher taxes or lower spending, but, but we can't have a scenario in which inflation is low and interest rates are low and taxes are low and spending is high. It, life doesn't work that way. Mm. True. Death and taxes. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, well, hopefully we've given Jim Chalmers a lot of good advice. I wouldn't be surprised if he takes it, but I also wouldn't be surprised if I, I know he loves the show, but if he ignores our advice, given that an election is coming up. Exactly. Well, let's move on to our second story, which is homes are taking longer to build than ever before. Average build times have blown out to 13 months for houses, 16 months for townhouses, and 33 months for apartments, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics. That means build times for all home types are at their longest since records began in 2010. Now, if we compare the figures to 2020, it takes about 50% longer to build a house and about 20% longer to build a townhouse and apartment. REA Group economic analyst Megan Liu says there are two reasons homes are taking longer to build, supply constraints and labour shortages, which then leads me Owen, to this question, can anything be done to ease constraints in building supplies? Oh, um, that's an interesting one. It's um, building supplies is, um, oh, it's um that's 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 probably um outside my scope a little bit um of of knowledge and expertise um in terms of um yeah maybe make it easier for imports of building supplies uh is uh, one way to be able to make it easier um and um if um, and, and if that was able to bring down the the cost of those building supplies as well at the same time, then that could help um, uh, uh, inflation and building and and bringing the cost down of building a house. Um, other than that, um, yes, uh, that would be because uh, there, there are a lot of building supplies that are import imported. So um, it's. Uh, the the other issue with getting building supplies though is the the lack of labour, because the supplies that are are uh, the building supplies that are um, manufactured here um, need trades to be able to manufacture them. So and there is a, a massive labour shortage in this country. Mm, well, is there anything that can be done to? address the, the shortage of construction workers? Well, you know, we, we, we've we talked about halting immigration uh, because we had massive immigration in um, the previous couple of years. And, but that that's the quickest way of, of um, bringing back, um, uh, you know, more, more labor into the market is um, bringing more trades in from overseas. Uh, but then, We've got the problem of needing to house them, so mm. it's um, so it's a double-edged sword there. Um, long term, though, I think we need to get back to um, uh, promoting trades as a um, a good career for 
our our young people in school. Yeah, let let's let's bring back uh, you know instead of forcing all of our uh, kids to go through to um, do the final two years of high school so that they can get good grades to go to university. Let's start encouraging them to do a trade, um, start a trade while at school um, and start studying for it. If they could use those last two years to um, study a trade and then they're, they're halfway to getting their trade uh, when they go out into the workforce. So um, I think we need to start encouraging that uh, a lot more with our young people. Mm, that's a very interesting point you make because while I'm a big believer in the benefits of university, having been to uni myself, I also think it can be overrated. I, I think with some uh, professions, you definitely need a degree, but with others, I, I don't think you do, or I don't think you should. Uh, learning a trade that's very practical knowledge. And if someone is that way inclined, you can build an incredible career as a tradie. And so I like the idea of having our education system uh, set up in such a way to make that sort of pathway easier to follow. Hmm. And um, I, I mean, we're at the situation now due to the lack of labour where uh, for trades, where I, I would um, I would presume now that the the median uh, income of uh, a trade would be uh, like a fully qualified trade uh, would be higher than the median income of university graduates. You might be right. If you want to make a lot of money these days, become a movie star or a carpenter. Yeah, or even a plumber or a sparky. Yeah, it's um, it's <laughs> um, have, yeah, it, it's it's um, and, and that's all due to there being a a shortage of these trades. We've spoken before about the federal government's target to facil facilitate the building of one point two million homes in the five years from July twenty twenty four. If homes are taking longer to build and there's this shortage of workers, is the government going to miss the target? Oh, no doubt they're going to miss it. It's they're going to miss it the, the 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 moment they announced it. <laughs> um, it's it was it was ridiculous. Yeah, it it, it it's good to have a goal, but um, you know, it's you either have to start taking massive action uh, to be able to achieve that goal. Um, or just make it more realistic. You've uh, you've had a, a shot at Jim Chalmers in our previous story, who of course is a podcast listener. I think you've had a shot at Albo, who I know for a fact also listens to all our episodes. Uh, you're not taking any prisoners today. No, not at all. It's um, it's one of those days, Nick. Okay, well, save your anger for our third and final story. NAB moving away from brokers. NAB CEO Andrew Irvine said the bank plans to increase the share of home loans originated internally, which is another way of saying NAB plans to reduce the share of home loans originated by brokers. Australian home lending returns have gradually improved, reflecting more stable pricing and lower cost of funding, Irvine said. However, as you can see in the data published by the Reserve Bank, front book pricing remains well below historical levels. This market remains dynamic and we will continue to adopt a disciplined approach to manage our long-term returns. As part of this approach, a key priority for me is to improve our share of lending through proprietary channels. Actions we are taking include investing in our banker sales force and driving greater banker productivity through digital and data tools, such as lead generation and virtual meetings, end quote. Irvine also said an increase in proprietary home lending would help NAB, quote, deliver stronger returns to shareholders. Owen, is NAB right to shift focus away from brokers? Um, oh, for, for their business, I, I don't take that away from them. Their, their focus should be, you know, their own business um, to be able to um, grow themselves. And, and, and since NAB has sold off 
um, their um, mortgage broking business. Um, you know, it, it's um, it kind of makes sense that they were going to make this decision. Um, you know, are they really all, all they're going to do is take market share away from other banks' proprietary, you know, um, bu uh, business? Um, because brokers are going to continue to take a bigger market share of of the whole. So um, are they going to make more money as a result? Is it going to be worthwhile? I, I don't think so. Well, the thing that uh, uh, irritates, maybe concerns me when I read these stories about banks wanting to do more proprietary lending I know in the past banks have resented brokers, uh, but broker market share has just kept rising and rising. And as that's happened, I think banks have come to terms with brokers and realised they're not going away. But part of me thinks that there's still this little bit of resentment towards brokers. And despite the fact that banks often talk the talk about how much they love brokers, I just feel as though there's this little bit of resentment and that there's part of them that just wants to take stuff back from brokers. Do you think I'm maybe uh, being a little paranoid here or, or do you think those are justified concerns? No, no, fully justified. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it, especially the major banks, they they despise the fact that they are not in control of the marketplace anymore um, when it comes to home lending. And um, if they're not in charge of, of that market share, and that marketplace, then it means that they can't sell all their ancillary products. Um, so, um, but you know, these banks they're still making billions of dollars a year in 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 profit. So, but they're still concerned about um, um, you know losing control of the marketplace. So, yeah. Well, what's interesting is uh, the big four banks are responsible for about 75% of home loans in Australia. But if you have a look at uh, where brokers send their loans, uh, brokers are sending fewer than 50% of their loans to the big four banks. Mm. So brokers definitely help stimulate competition in the marketplace, which is why they're so great for consumers and for the economy, but not so great for the big four banks. Absolutely. It's, um, yeah, if it wasn't for brokers, then uh, we, we'd probably be stuck with only four banks in this country mm. uh, by now. And it's uh, because they would have gobbled up um, the, the rest of the smaller competition. So it's, um, it's um, not surprising that they're upset and they're trying to take back their advantage. So, um, yeah, we, we need to cull that and keep chipping away at, um, at uh, their market share as much as possible. I don't know if the NAB executive team listened to our podcast, but if they are listening, I'm not impressed. Yeah, neither am I. <laughs> well, thank you, Owen. On that note, let's wrap things up. Thank you for another great oh. week. Wow, another week gone already. It's uh, flying by. So um, thank you, Nick, for bringing the news once again and uh, looking forward to um, having another chat soon.